uh, Tillits is not all bad. Um, but it's a little bit like with any catastrophe that we introduce into nature. It is a form of catastrophe, Tillits. So um, we do know that sometimes catastrophe can actually, um, if it is a wildfire or a flooding event or whatever the catastrophe normally happens in nature, can actually create an increase of life. And Tillis does that as well. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project, a grassroots farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label that distinguishes soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock. You just heard from Real Organic farmer Jean-Paul Cortens touching upon a very touchy subject in organic agriculture, tillage. Before we return to the conversation and Jean-Paul's thoughts on the benefits and downsides of tillage for vegetables, we'd like to ask you to please leave a rating and review of our podcast and share it with your friends. We'd like to continue reaching new people to tell them about how farmers are standing up to the corporate takeover of the organic label. Now let's get back to the interview between my co-director, Dave Chapman, and exceptional organic farmer and mentor, Jean-Paul Cortens. I'd like to talk now about, about farming. And, um, you know, this, sure. this podcast isn't essentially designed for how people farm, but we'll, we get into it a little bit. And, and I need, I think that civilians care too. So let's just talk, you, you did a, a, a really wonderful kind of a farm, which is mixed livestock and vegetables. So part mm -hmm. of it is kind of uh, truck gardening, uh, it would be called truck farming. And, and yep. you've got some intensive market gardening in there and you got some livestock. So could you talk about that? And like, what's the relationship? How many acres of what compared to what? Yeah. Um... Well, the, the, the way that when we uh, looked for land, um, when we lost the lease on the first farm, was to think about how we could at least have enough vegetable land available so we could take uh, at least half about of that out of production at any given year. So we could build fertility, uh, especially um, make sure that when our nutrient budgeting, we would have uh, nitrogen coming in from the air by growing legumes. So legumes and cereals were grown in the neutral year. And then in the cash crop year, we would have 50% of our total nitrogen input would come from that. And then um, we also wanted to maintain some of the other fertility that we needed for the vegetables um, coming from our own manure, which means that we needed to have livestock. So when we started looking for land, um, we wanted to make sure that it would be a good balance between um, uh, available hay fields and uh, available um, vegetable land. Um, and we ended up uh, having, um, by the time that I left Roxbury, uh, we had about 430 acres of land, of which only about 45 acres at any given time were uh, planted in vegetables. So uh, almost, you know, or a little bit more than 10% of our total land was um, dedicated to growing vegetables. Another 45 acres then were dedicated to growing green manures. And then the remainder of the land was either wildlife habitat uh, or hay fields and pasture dedicated to uh, our livestock. Now, would you go... Uh an acre that was in vegetables this year, would that almost certainly be in green manure next year? Is that how that would work? Yeah, we initially were trying to integrate the animals with the vegetable land, but what we're, we're finding was, even with sheep, uh, we had 100 sheep and about 50 uh, um, beef cows, uh, that the compaction, especially the service compaction, was so great uh, that it wasn't worth it. So to have them graze off a green manure crop, by fully integrating the animals in the vegetable land did not work out. Um, the other thing with sheep is that if they do break out, they love your vegetables. So <laughs> we had a couple of times, we, we actually lost a complete crop of cabbage because they, uh, they got out of that temporary <laughs> fence. <laughs> and we, there was actually a complete segregation between uh, the livestock uh, and, and the vegetables. So yes, the answer is um, 
one year it would be depending on what would follow after that a particular agreement or crop grown so okay that's so interesting because you know i guess uh i had the idea that you know the that the animals would do the mob grazing and and mm. you know the pooping and the chopping it up with their hooves and then yeah and then you'd get your vegetables the next year but in fact you had vegetable land which was rotating in and out of green manures and you had livestock mm -hmm. land and they were they were two two independent pieces yeah. of ground they were yeah. yeah and i think the the food safety later on even um made it even more abundantly clear that um even the people working in the livestock department they had to completely change their boots at the moment that they would be helping out in the vegetables we really realized that there's a reason why you really don't want to mix those two up uh, too much the way that they were interfacing was through the manure um, making compost out of the the, the pack uh, the winter pack and then um, spreading that on our vegetable end yeah yeah okay so would you would you compost that uh, winter pack before you would spread it? Absolutely, yeah. And the ideal time of spreading would be at the end of the green manure cycle, so uh, sometime in September, uh, the year before the cash cropping year. So it wouldn't be a complete compost. Um, it would probably be considered to be uh, raw manure, even though it was taken out in the spring, um, say in March, out of the free stall. Uh, being put onto a manure pile um, and some years we had access to a compost turner um, which uh, was made available uh, from a friend um, but sometimes we just would turn it with a skid steer um, and then it would be relatively finished uh, compost but probably not to the standards and also we didn't turn it as much as NOP would require so spreading it in the fall would be a safe way of making sure that we wouldn't be in violation with food safety. I would think actually that composting it for three or four summer months would pretty well count as composting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you would think so. Yeah, yeah the, the, the NFA rules well, are, are they're, written they're in a rules way. Well, their rules were crazy, but I think they abandoned those crazy rules. I don't think that okay. those are current. They, they, they came in with uh, really strict rules, I guess, because of somebody in the USDA and food safety. But, but nobody was doing it that way, and they realized that, that there was actually, it was, it was a little silly. Um, yeah. You know, they, they just were. Yeah. We had our compost tested at one point when we were going through the GAP, uh, International GAP right. certification, and we mm -hmm. were so low on anything. You know, it was, it tested so, so uh, positively in terms of uh, bad right. pathogens. So clearly it, mm -hmm. it was, it was su successful. It's not a crazy okay. thing to have that test done. Um, mm -hmm. And, and we were, we were off the charts good. So it made me feel good. Um, yeah. So, uh, in the biodynam biodynamic model, uh, of course, livestock would always be incorporated in a farm, ideally, at least, ideally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of attention is paid to composting as well. How much, you know, how much did you, how much had you been trained in composting before you started at, at Hawthorne Valley? A training in composting? Yeah, like how much had you been taught how much sure. have you studied mm -hmm. I, I have to say that most most organic farmers uh, in, in America seem to be a bit casual about composting and okay. uh, so I know right. that some Europeans mm -hmm. are very very uh, rigorous about about their idea of quality compost so I was curious what your ideas were mm -hmm. and where they came from well, they were definitely um, based on my training um, in biodynamic uh, agriculture. We had a teacher uh, who was a fanatic composter, and he had many different methods of composting. Um, all the kitchen waste, uh, because we had a, uh, a dormitory uh, at our school, and we all had our lunch um, served by the chef at the school. And so all the kitchen waste all had to be composted. And so he would also demonstrate all the different ways in which he was composting. Um, for example, he would take some things out of the agriculture course with uh, uh, burned lime, and um, he would use some of that method in a uh, whereby he had actually dug some pits whereby he would compost it that one way. 
the other way she would make a pile and then it would be frequently turned. And we would be able to not only um, see the, um, the test, the compost that they came back from it, but he would, really wanted us to, and there was a big emphasis on direct experience. Look at it, smell it, what does it you know, do to you? So um, while later on, I think it became more scientific for me when you know, in being introduced to the Loopkeys and Will Brinton, whereby there was a bit of a contrast between their methodologies. Um, I, I think I've always appreciated the fact that um, we were taught that the most important organ of a farmer is your nose. And at the moment that you, when the compost smells very strongly, no matter what, you're losing something. So what are you going to do about it? And I think this is... Um, has been very worthwhile because it's not only about making a finished product. It's also about making sure that your nutrients stay on the farm. And so over time, I have more uh, ascribed to the system that Will Brinton used instead of the frequent turning method. Um, I looked at it. I thought a product coming out of it, it looks very nice. Um, but I think the, const the pile that is more um, left by itself um, and that has enough porosity to be active, so there is no raw manure inside at the core of that. Um, I find that to, um, you know, I, I, I really ended up working with that system more. So even though we had a compost turner available, it was actually only used to make the initial pile and to bring in the right porosity initially. And then we would cover it up with a compost cover um, uh, in order to avoid leaching. And, um, and the second time we would uh, take it, it would go into the manure spreader and spread on our vegetable land. And it wouldn't look like the Lupke compost. It wouldn't look like the stuff that comes out of a bag from Vermont compost. Um, because there would still be some straw in there and everything else. But um, it, it was uh, definitely a product that I think is safe. Yeah, yeah. Well, and beyond safe. I mean, a, a great addition. To the to this to the life in the soil. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so one of the things that has become a, a, a very active conversation in my life is uh, inputs versus no inputs, and um, mm -hmm. I talk with Elliot a lot about this. So I, I tell you, Elliot is somebody who came from a background of inputs. He when he started his farm, he made a lot of compost to enrich the very, very poor soil. I mean, it was very poor. And and so, and as they mm -hmm. built it up, he's been working on more and more being able to just grow his fertility. It sounds mm -hmm. like you were primarily growing your fertility with the addition of some animal manures. Is that right? Um, so there, there was no way that Roxbury Farm was ever going to be self-contained in the sense that our animal manure and that what we were because the hay fields um, still had to be fertilized as well. So uh, I really looked at the cow manure as almost medicinal in a way, um, because we also needed compost the poultry manure in order to not deplete uh, the land. There was so much export of vegetables that um, there's no way that we could have um, been a farm without no inputs. I think my emphasis has always been on... Um, reducing inputs and reducing costs, uh, but not eliminating them. So um, I think applying uh, compost or pulled manure in order to have the right amount of nitrogen will actually create an excess of nutrients, uh, especially of phosphorus. So by looking at the phosphorus as like, okay, well, I will maintain that, but I won't spread more than that or bring more in than what I need there. Um, we ended up with never having enough nitrogen coming from either the animal manure uh, from our own farm or from the composted poultry manure. So we really were forced to uh, bring that in out of the air to the legumes. And that's really where um, uh, I think actually Elliot and I ended up very much agreeing. He was very much became a proponent of the lay system whereby you are taking your land out of production for three years and grow your own carbon and grow your own nitrogen. 
uh, and, and enriching your land that way. Um, the way whereby we have vegetables, um, uh, have a land, have a piece of land constantly in production of vegetables is long term just not sustainable. And maintaining that uh, fertility through animal manure um, can, can create problems. Mm -hmm. What kind of problems? Excessive amount of nutrients. Mm -hmm. um, so because you, you are, you're trying to keep that growth going um, by going with that relatively low amount of nitrogen that is in that animal manure in relationship to the phosphorus and potassium. Mm. We see this problem um, when there is no leaching in high tunnels. Uh, we see some soil tests coming back out of a high tunnels um, whereby actually a ma a many um, nutrients are being tied up um, because there is excessive amount of uh, potassium in those soils that then lead up to um, tie up of micronutrients. Mm -hmm. And so the, the use of green manuring was a way of getting nitrogen to that crop without increasing particularly the phosphorus. Correct. Okay. And by minimizing the amount of compostable poultry manure that we would bring into the farm or uh, bringing in the animal manure, where, of course, the, 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 the fertility was based on the fact that we have hay fields um, that produce the excess fertility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Will Brinton told me once that the best compost, best quality compost he ever saw I think it was from Switzerland, and it was made entirely out of green matter. Uh, wow. All plants composted, and they made a very superb potting mix out of it. Uh, mm. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Getting into that kind of thing where you, you swirl the wine around in your mouth and then spit it out, uh, you know, but, but it, it, it interests me because we're, we're very intensive, and so, uh, you mm -hmm. know, that... that the quality of the compost makes a big difference for us in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, uh, thank you. Let's talk about let's talk about um, tillage for a minute because that's a hot topic, also. Um, yeah, and you know, no till has become a bit of a mm, religious belief in um, the popular culture right now. I encounter it over and over again. We even encounter it with some of our uh, real organic project farms who are certified and they refer to themselves as regenerative farmers. And, um, you know, regenerative is now embraced by Monsanto, by Cargill, by Dannon, by General Mills. Everybody, everybody, I mean, just everybody wants to call themselves regenerative. And it's not, there's no, everybody has a different definition, so it means whatever you want it to mean. I think mm -hmm. that the regen movement has had the problem of being too successful too fast. And so it became uh, popular in the marketplace before there was a big enough core of farmers who, who really adhered to it. And, and uh, we'll see what happens next, but it, it seems like it's sort of running amok in the marketplace right now. So I'm mm -hmm. curious because you till, you're, you, when you grow your mm -hmm. vegetables, you till. Yeah, and mm -hmm. um, so I, I've even interviewed people for this symposium who would probably uh, have a low opinion of that. Not farmers necessarily. <laughs> so I'm curious, uh, what do you think about tillage versus no-till? You know, when is tillage appropriate? How to do it skillfully? Mm -hmm. Can you uh, improve the soil and the life in the soil with tillage? Yeah, it is a complicated uh, um you know, subject matter, because I don't think um, we're at any point yet where we can, um, on a commercial scale, uh, grow vegetables uh, absolutely no-till. Um, I do need to study some of the systems that are done on a smaller scale uh, with tarping and with um, sheet composting and to what extent the sheet composting does not lead to excessive nutrients or not, whereby they are suppressing the weeds by basically providing a layer of compost. So aside from that, um, uh, tillage is not all bad, um, but it's a little bit like with any catastrophe that we introduce into nature. It is a form of catastrophe tillage. So 
um, we do know that sometimes catastrophe can actually, um, if it is a wildfire or a flooding event or whatever the catastrophe normally happens in nature, can actually create an increase of life. And Tillis does that as well. Um, there's mineralization that will happen after we um, apply tillage. Um, the second thing that's really important about tillage is weed control. Um, if we don't do any tillage, we will see that a lot of perennials um, will invade our vegetable land very quickly. So tillage is a great way to eliminate some of the perennial weeds that would otherwise uh, invade uh, our fields. And weed control in general is a lot easier um, when we apply tillage. I guess the, the challenge has been always for me, like what is responsible tillage? And um, I haven't used a moldboard plow uh, since 92 um, because I think inverting it is definitely damaging. So applying vertical tillage has been um, something that I ascribe to, if it's either a chisel plow or a, a tine harrow or any of that. And then incorporating cover crops is not a form of responsible tillage because what you're really doing is you're um, bringing in all that organic matter. Say you have a crop of sorghum sudan with uh, sun hemp or crotillaria. And when you incorporate that, uh, if you're able to incorporate that, um, you're really feeding a lot of soy life there. And you can see how um, that actually increases soil structure. Um, we, we know that increasing soil structure um, can be done somewhat with a tillage tool, but it's really done with what we call raw organic matter. Um, that organic matter does not actually improve soil structure. Soil structure is really improved when we are feeding um, living plants, um, or some people will advocate using raw manure because it is still a very raw way. Um, of uh, applying that uh, final product that eventually will become compost. Feeding this microorganism and making them active is the way in which we can really improve the soil. And we do have to incorporate that. So there are ways in which I really believe that um, tillage can be a very good thing. But if you do it too much, you mineralize the soil too much, you lose organic matter, and it's all about a matter of balance here. Can we grow enough organic matter in these neutral years with our green manures um, to offset um, uh, the tillage that we do in what we call the cash crop year? Now, we have found, um, the Nordells have found the same thing, and, and you know I don't want to gloss over that, Eric and Anne Nordell, uh, who were some uh, of my mentors in working out rotations. Um, and I've learned by listening to them and, and actually I adopted their rotation and modified it. I mean, I didn't come up with this. Um, we would never consider what we do at a Roxbury farm in the Netherlands where land goes for hundreds of thousands, you know, per hectare. You cannot set land aside for growing green manures there. It's just not financially viable. So where land is, you know, relatively inexpensive, um, we are able to do this. And so um, I, I, I was able to work with them. And what we found over years, we looked at our soil test, is that by growing green manures, especially tall green manures in off-season years, we were able to increase organic matter, despite the fact that we applied tillage. And that's an interesting thing. Now, should we try to um, reduce tillage even more? Absolutely, and I'm super interested in that for a small number of crops like fall cabbage, fall broccoli, uh, some plantings of sweet corn, pretty much all our green beans, and of course in field crops, corn and soybeans. We are able to uh, grow a cover crop, roll and crimp this, and plant directly through it, which is saves time, it saves labor, and if we figure out the weed control aspect of this, um, would be a great way to capture even more carbon because we don't have to introduce another cycle of tillage before we plant these crops. And what we have found by doing that research is that the crops are healthier. Crops actually do not like to be planted in a field that has been recently tilled. Um, the moisture holding capacity of the soil is much greater 
and they're actually healthier. Um, we have a, a trial going on right now here at Philia Farm in an acre of uh, green cabbage. And it's very interesting to see the weed ecology between the control plots and the plots where um, we did the rolling and crimping of triticale and veg. Uh, it's a complete different um, uh, beast. There is lamb's quarter, there's all kinds of annual weeds in the control plots. And all we're finding right now in the rolled and crimp plots is clover. Mm. There is an understory of medium red clover growing in the cabbage. And it's, it's really, really healthy. And I don't know what's going on in a particular field, but I've only had to spray for imported cabbage worm once. And like, that's unusual. I remember having to spray weekly. Uh, but we're doing the scouting and we only spray when needed. And there was one time that we had to spray. Is there some balance there? I don't know. I We didn't look for that. Uh, I'm not an entomologist. I did not look for that particular finding. But again, the same thing in the control plots on a hot day, the cabbage wilted in the areas, even with the understory and the competition of medium red clover, the cabbage is perfectly happy and uh, does not seem to require water. So there's a lot of promise there, but we haven't worked out the king yet. And there's other benefits for reducing your tillage, um, aside from carbon sequestration. We can get healthier crops as well. But there's a lot of work to be done here. And um, I'm just glad I'm at a stage in my life where I can dedicate some more uh, time and energy to do just that instead of being worried about, like, am I going to lose, you know, certain amount of pounds of cabbage out of this yield? Because we're definitely not getting the yields right now. Um, that we were supposed to get unless we, because there is competition right now between the weeds and the cabbage. I'm not going to deny that compared to a completely clean field, artificially irrigated and everything else. I mean, we're not there yet, but there is hope. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a lot of learning going on and mm. there's a community sharing ideas about this is, this is an ongoing development. Uh, That's correct. Yeah, in in organic farming. Yeah, uh, Elliot has been uh, <laughs> quoting Edward Faulkner to me a lot lately. Uh, Edward Faulkner, who wrote *Plowman's Folly* back in the forties, and but he's been quoting from Faulkner's sequel to that called *A Second Look*. Oh, I didn't know and, that. Okay. Yes, it's very interesting. And he said, Faulkner said, "My my book was misunderstood. I'm not I'm not objecting to tillage. I'm objecting to the moldboard plow that mm. flips." The organic matter over and buries it right. and it just creates problems and he he believed in trash farming and harrowing yeah uh, okay and he thought it it's interesting because one of the things he he says is that you know of course there's all the biological activity in, in a healthy soil but but there's also chemical activity by uh bringing in that aeration and introducing the organic matter in the top four inches and that you actually get acids formed that are etching out the the uh, minerals from the uh, from the soil instead of just from the microbes getting the minerals there's also acids doing it wow and i, I thought wow that's really you know so he said you want that co2 in the soil mm -hmm. and it and it and it creates a carbonic acid so i, I thought it was quite interesting he was a smart guy absolutely uh, i am uh, going to look for that book because it uh, confirms what I've already experienced um, is that the moldboard plow is a terrible tool and yes. that tillage itself is not so bad. Yeah, 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 right. I mean, the moldboard plow was a, a miracle uh, when it was invented because it enabled them to, to create tillage in places where it was almost impossible for better and for worse. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it just became this, this fallback tool that, that was very destructive. Right. Okay, so um, I think that's I think that's good, um, Jean Paul. I, I wanted to get into it a little bit. It's a complex conversation. When mm -hmm. I've talked to a lot of people about regenerative, and I say, well, you know, but I hate that they use so much glyphosate. And they said, glyphosate. <laughs> you know, they'd been through trainings on this, mm -hmm. and these were c consumers, not farmers, mm -hmm. and they had no idea mm -hmm. that that regenerative. Conventional regenerative is based on the use of herbicides. Yeah. And uh, 
Also, most of those people are, are livestock and, and pasture, you know, big field farmers. They're not growing vegetables. They're not growing mm -hmm. for market in that way. It's a different market. It's a different agriculture. We know that it sequesters carbon like crazy. You know, it's, it's great. You know, uh, mm -hmm. in a good pasture system, you can do wonderful things for the soil. Right. Okay. Um, let's, let's, you said, you said once, actually you said at the last symposium, nature is not just out there. Mm -hmm. We are nature. We are a part of it. Yeah. I, th I thought that was a very strong statement as it, it pretty accurately reflected um, your whole talk. And you've talked a lot about climate change and agriculture. Mm -hmm. as, as I think the most dangerous intersection of agriculture and nature mm -hmm. is, is the impact uh, on the climate um, of bad agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you could talk about that and start by talking about when did this idea first occur to you? I don't think, I'm guessing when you were a teenager, you weren't concerned about climate change. So mm -hmm. at what point did you start to worry about, can be concerned about climate change and start to connect it to farming? Well, actually, those ideas started to form um, in my training uh, uh, in biodynamic agriculture, where um, there's this one sentence in the agriculture course where Steiner said we should strive for the farm to be a self-contained organism. And so working that through with our soil um, science teacher, you know, it's like this, well, how do you do that? Um, because there's a lot of losses all the time um, within agriculture. Um, you know, carbon is constantly being released, uh, nutrients are constantly being leached out. So how do you create a system whereby you maintain um, most of your nutrients within the farm? So what is that? What makes this farm um, having integrity? And I talked about in my talk a lot about how the mycorrhizal, especially our vascular mycorrhizal organism, play a central role in ensuring that nutrients do not get leached out too much. Um, so that's where I would say that it began to think about like how, as a farm, um, can you maintain integrity? And then when you extrapolate on that, I realized like, wow, if farms all over the world would consider this and think about this, we wouldn't have a dead zone in the Gulf. We, um, we, we, we really wouldn't have these incredible output of methane into the atmosphere. And you start putting two and two together. Um, but also we have to think that agriculture alone, of course, is, um, is the, when we talk about contributing to climate change and land use in general, and we're talking about forestry management, we're talking about land use in the sense of how people are paving over land um, and how we are using land in general as a wastebasket. So I think that that is something that we just need to be more aware of. And that's where my statement comes from. We are nature. We are not treating it as something that is part of us. If we actually look at the land and we see this, that this land is really, that we, we are, if it wasn't for the land, we wouldn't be here. Um, we are land. And we are really uh, transformed land. We are transformed soil. Um, I think if you really feel that, if you really sense that, then um, you can no longer do the things that we're doing to the land. I, I'm absolutely convinced about that. And if we would practice that, um, it would be a very important step to mitigating climate change. I, I'm absolutely certain about that. We would really see the earth as as something that is sacred um and um yeah okay thank you and i want to pursue how we do that but i want to go back for a moment and say okay when did you start to connect these dots you you were trained in in how to care for the land how to care for the soil how important that was when did it occur to you that something was happening 
in the climate of the planet mm. and and that farming was part of that it was part of the problem and of course i believe it's also part of the solution so what when did that come to you cuz i my understanding is now you feel that very clearly maybe you could talk about that yeah well um i would say that we had a very hot and dry summer in 1999. And after that, we had an incredible wet summer in 2000. And it slowly started to dawn on me that all the normal years that I experienced uh, in the first 10 years of farming were over with. Um, nothing seemed easy anymore. And things have become gradually more and more difficult, whereby um, farmers I speak to um, everybody will, will look at it and say like, well, I hope 2018 will never happen again. And then they say like, well, I don't. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's something that we are aware of is that we see it all around us and it becomes clearer and clearer over time. But I would say my wake up moment was that I, for the first time, experienced late blight in 2000. I lost all the tomatoes and I realized like, you know, these rain events, uh, there's something to stay. And it, it started being talked about. So it was a relatively late awakening uh, as a farmer for me. Um, and I would say, you know, it is 20 years ago, but it is relatively recent. Uh, while a lot of people already were aware of that way before that. Um, then we saw the scientific forecast about uh, what would happen due to climate change. And I started making precautions by putting artificial uh, drain uh, tiles uh, in the ground. And thank God we did, um, based on the recommendation of Fern Grubbinger, who said like, look guys, prepare for the fact it's gonna be wetter than usual. And I took that um, by heart and, and we made the precaution and he said also it's going to be followed by some really dry events so make sure you also have access to irrigation well investing heavily in both irrigation and in tiles um, allowed our farm to continue to farm under these very difficult seasons and I talked to old-time farmers and I said like was it always like that like no no it wasn't like that so we do know that um, things have changed for the worse it's the nature of such a huge change. It's very hard to see. Uh, I see one thing, you see another. When we step back and start to look at it from a global perspective, um, then the picture becomes a bit clearer. Uh, one, of the, one of the people we interviewed for the symposium is David Grinspoon, who has worked with NASA a lot. And he has said that, well, in our effort to uh, get into space and communicate with other uh, intelligence in the universe, we've learned a great deal more about our planet as we try to understand how would we even recognize intelligence on another planet. Right. And we've looked at our own planet, and he said, you know, the changes are so rapid and so dramatic, seen from a big, big time scale. Mm -hmm. It's just like that. It's like, oh my God, what is going on here? Yeah. Um, so... Tell me your thoughts about you've 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 read you've you've studied you've talked. How do you think that? What do you think the negative impact of agriculture is on climate change? And then we'll talk about the positive impact. Well, um, it all depends on the how. Um, I do know that feedlots um, and the way that we keep animals has a very negative effect on climate change. Uh, we all know that um, when there is no positive connected to the negative, it's a just negative. So if, if the cows burp out methane, but there's really nothing being done to build land elsewhere while they're say grazing or whatever it is, the positive effects of the grassland, there, there is, you know, um, it's very hard to justify um, what we're doing. The second thing is, of course, um, nitrogen. Nitrogen that is being um, spread on the land and how it is being produced, it leads to a lot of negatives. Um, and we know that the dead zone 
is one thing, but it is also about what happens um, uh, going into the air. So there are definitely, uh, and the third one would be tillage, um, which of course now with the regenerative impulse, with the no-till, they are claiming that that is greatly reduced. Um, I'm actually um, a little skeptical there uh, about that, um, how beneficial it really is to have a, um, these very, very hard grounds that are almost impenetrable um, in the Midwest um, and whereby um, only a little bit organic matter is being formed on the surface, but actually there is no, no gain. There's not like, um, oh, we see this tremendous building of organic matter in these cornfields because it's just simply not happening. We don't see it. So um, I actually, um, I, I see that the, the, the agriculture as we have today is highly dependent on petrochemicals. So uh, yes, I can see uh, why agriculture is right now overall a negative. And if we then look on a global scale and we see the burning of the Amazon in order to create grazing land, we know it goes, you know, it's, it's, it's everywhere where that happened, deforestation in order to make place for agriculture. Yes, land use in general has contributed 800 billion tons of carbon dioxide um, to the atmosphere already, and it is ongoing. It is not, uh, it's, there's no positive trend yet, unless we change the way we farm. Yeah. Yeah. Did you uh, happen to read Jonathan Sanford Forrest's book, We Are the Weather? I have not. It is a, he's a very good writer. He's a, you know, a vegan and he, he admits that uh, there's one line in the book that says, well, of course, it, there is good agriculture. If it's done that way, it's a whole different story. But then, and then, you know, but he says, and, and I think he's being realistic, 99% 99.9, .9, he says, of our meat, milk, and eggs in America come from CAFOs. Yeah. And he said, so, you know, that other agriculture, which I would call real organic, and, uh, you know, and, and I'll say the very best of regenerative, you know, that that, that has a different impact. But if we, if we and, and even in organic now, we have to say the majority of eggs come from CAFOs. And probably the majority of milk at this point come from CAFOs, certified organic milk. Um, and, you know, that's a horrifying thing. It's, it's so the opposite of what we all intended. So I'm just curious, you know, he has a fairly eloquent description of why CAFOs are, are contributing to climate change. Do you, do you have any knowledge of that that you would talk about or is, is that... Uh, something we'll we'll pass over for now. I mean, it's mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot of technical stuff. But. That's that is a lot of technical stuff, and I think that ultimately is that like, you know, it's the devil is in the detail, and and also with a technical definition of a CAFO, depending on what state you're in, um, you know, there are um, there are some really bad examples out there, and there are farmers who are doing a wonderful job even though they might fall under the definition of a cave. So we'd be really, really careful there to not um, describe all CAFOs um, just because they're called CAFOs. Um, let's look at all the individual examples. Let's actually talk about the practices themselves, what they are doing, uh, how they're spreading manure, are they incorporating it? Are they, all these things, it's really about cultural practices uh, more than like, how many animals are actually on this farm. And actually you gave this beautiful example of this organic farm in California one time that wanted to be part of the Real Organic Project that would technically be a CAFO. And I'm like, let's not go there because um, it, it, that, that, that is not helpful. Um, what we well, really... They were, they, yeah, they were the exception, just to say. Yes. You know, and, and I hear what you're... I agree with you that just because you have a lot of animals doesn't mean you're a confinement operation. Right. And maybe confinement is better because those cows at that large place went out to pasture every day. Exactly. And they really went out to pasture to eat. Yeah. They didn't just go out to chew their cud from the grain they got in the barn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they live in, in you know, uh, the best 
grass growing, uh, you know, county yeah. in the country. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, so absolutely. So we're talking about large confinement operations, correct? Mostly in the desert. And I know, you know <laughs> and, and there's no grass. So, all right, let's talk about those. Um, just from an animal welfare perspective alone. Um, and then the fact that this manure is just sitting there baking in the sun, evaporating, it's just, it's a horror story in my opinion. So this is not the way that we should um, produce uh, uh, meat or milk. It's just, <laughs> look, if we would actually take climate change seriously and we take animal welfare seriously, that kind of agriculture would no longer exist. It's that simple. And if we see it as a national emergency to address this, you know, just to be able to, to say like, well, the food production is central to our national security. It's essential to mitigating climate change. Then, you know, all that money that is made available for all kinds of other projects could be made available to transition to a whole new way in which we relate to the natural world. But it's just simply not a priority. I think it's absolutely possible. And that's what I also laid out in my talk. I mean, there were 40 million bisons roaming the, uh, uh, the prairie. You know, I mean, why not reintroduce this grassland methodology again, whereby this land had captured up to 15% of a total organic matter, you know, 15% uh, of the um, total mass was organic matter in the prairies. That's a lot of sequestration that was happening due to this wonderful interaction between a bovine and grassland. We can do that. We absolutely have the ability. It's actually not rocket science, you know, and, but there's no will behind it. We don't see, um, why that would be important to do. And would that mean a, a slight reduction in, in people's meat consumption? Yeah, possibly, which is not a bad thing either. Uh, would it mean that food would be a little bit more expensive? Yeah, all that thing. But right now, there are so many places whereby there is excessive amount of spending happening that can be reduced if we don't feel it is necessary um, that some people uh, in this country get excessively wealthy. Um, so yes, it is all tied into a whole different way of organizing society and whereby people need to see, um, just like they did in the 20s when, they, when the, um, we had the Natural Resource Conservation Service um, tr starting to protect land. We need to have a plan like that again. I don't see any other way. Okay, so so we're talking about a, a pretty important shift in values here. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and and I think you know that a lot of people see the need for that. I also see a lot of people feel helpless about how to do that. And mm -hmm. um, so, can you imagine world pace here? Can you imagine like what what does it take to to change this? Does it take that people have an understanding of, of that they're part of nature? Does it take a change in how people uh, 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 address politics? I'm, I'm really curious what your thoughts are. Well, when Michael Pollan um, was hoping that uh, President Obama was going to change the way that food is being produced and distributed and basically creating a new food policy, Obama was asking him, like, where's the food movement? And since there was no food movement, we did not see anything except we saw the food safety um, law come into action, um, which is the only thing that really came out of administration um, that addressed some of the issues that have to do with food safety. But we didn't see much except for Michelle Obama, um, you know, uh, at, talking about the quality of food going into schools and everything else. And, but, but I think in order to make changes, we need to understand that unless we're asking for a very specific policy, 
that is um, underwritten with funding, nothing is going to change. If this new Green Deal does not also incorporate, and this is where we do need to have this conversation with our politicians, they need to be educated the importance of agriculture in that new Green Deal. If we don't transform the way we farm in this country, um, then um, we, we really are not going far enough, in my opinion. And it's going to take a lot of conversations because it's going to also, there's a big lobby that does not want to change. Um, and so where, where is it? But if we don't, if we only talk about this without asking for actual policy change, nothing will happen. Okay, so this is one of the questions that I try to explore because I think it's a big question, is you're, you're suggesting it's important that we make really good food choices when we buy, but you're saying we also need to change policy on the yes. governmental level. Absolutely. I mean, Denmark has done it. Denmark said like 50% of all farms need to be organic by 2020 something. And they've done it. They did it. It's really, that's a policy uh, decision that they made. And they did it because they wanted to make sure that their groundwater was no longer being polluted by um, the spreading of artificial nitrogen. So um, it is something that can be done as long as people see the necessity of it. And as long as they're willing to overcome the lobbyists on the other end. Yeah. But we do need a movement. We do need to create a movement. And you have actually, Dave, talked about this, how important it is to create a movement of people. Um, and that's where I think we, we all need to look at, that without a movement, we're nowhere. We just loan voices in the wilderness. Okay. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll end just about here. I'm just curious, do you, okay. have, do you have some words of hope? Do you, can you... Can you uh, imagine a path of how we change farming to, to uh, help the land and the people? I mean, you know, uh, if we have no, no sane agriculture, we have no, no human community. Do you have uh, mm -hmm. any thoughts? And I don't mean to put too much weight on you, <laughs> Jean Paul, but you know, we need to, we need to be, we need to, we need to have vision. Yeah. Um, uh, it seems, enormous at this point but um you know in the very short time i've been on this planet i've seen some very major changes coming along that were completely unimaginable before they happened i mean i've seen you know um, the transition of power in south africa the transition of power in east germany um the, the fall of the uh, soviet um union um and those are just some examples whereby we just didn't think that would happen. I think big changes will happen because things, unfortunately, um, will, you know, get worse before they get better. But they will get better. They will. Um, because ultimately, we as mankind, um, you know, ultimately good will prevail. And I'm convinced about that. All right. Jean-Paul Curtens, thank you so much. You've, you've spent hours of work in the past uh, helping Real Organic Project brainstorm and think, and you've spent years in the past uh, helping the organic community to grow. Um, and uh, so thank you from everybody for all that you've done. You're very welcome. <laughs> and it was wonderful having this conversation. Thank you for the good conversation. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you'll subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a review on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you found us. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to today's conversation, can be found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 20. Please join us next time for one of my favorite interviews with Stuart Hill to learn all about the mites that farm fungi in the soil. To find a real organic farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms.